And the theme for today, vision and scenarios for the future. And we are going to start off with two keynote speeches. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the speakers this morning. First, we have Mr. Al Faleh Khalid, the president and CEO of Saudi Aramco, the company that manages the world's largest proven oil reserves and is the world's largest producer, exporter of crude oil and a major natural gas producer. And also, we have Mr. Steve Bowles, the senior vice president, president and CEO of GE Power and Water of General Electric. Uh, GE Power and Water is one of the leading providers of efficient and reliable power generation technologies and services, as well as water and process technologies. The moderator for this morning's session is going to be a familiar face, Mr. Christoph Fry, uh, who has been the Secretary General of the World Energy Council since 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, with a big round of applause, please welcome the two speakers and our moderator up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great pleasure to not lose more time and simply hand over the stage to Khalid Al Fali for the first keynote. Please welcome Khalid Al Fali from Saudi Aramco. Thank you, uh, Christoph. You should give me an extra minute. It's a long walk to the podium. And uh, Yorubon Anyong Hashem Nika. And good morning, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's been three years uh, since we met in Montreal. Now, as we gather in Daegu, the global energy industry is healthier, more dynamic, and dare I say, more confident than ever. Indeed, those three short years have witnessed momentous change. So a chance to take stock of where we are, where we want to go, is more welcome than ever. To begin with, it's tremendously exciting time to be in Korea. Korea's industrialization, economic development, and resilience have astonished the world. Korea has indeed become a byword for quality and innovation, admired around the globe for its cars, smartphones, and much more. And the world is embracing Korea's culture and style. And I know some of you are thinking Gangnam style. The key ingredient, however, has been the energy of the Korean people. And that provides the perfect backdrop to this Congress where harnessing all the energy at our disposal will be fundamental to future success. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us in the energy industry face a historic challenge. Today, less than one third of the world's seven billion people consume more than two thirds of the primary energy supply of the world. The other five billion have varying degrees of access to supplies of modern energy, with some trapped in extreme energy poverty. By 2050, a total of nine billion people will aspire to a prosperous life. Knowing this, shouldn't we, at the energy industry, ensure that ready access to clean energy will be a right for all, not simply a privilege for a few. That is the inspirational challenge the world faces and the test we must pass as an industry, which is echoed in the World Energy Council's latest Trilemma report. So today, I want to explore the path to a, st to a sustainable energy future for all and how we can rise to meet it. 
Let me start with energy demand. As well as 2 billion additional people, the global economy will be three or hopefully even four times its size today by 2050. More people in affluence means more mobility, more urbanization, more demand for consumable and durable goods, which in turn will drive consumption for fuels, electricity, and chemical feed, feedstocks, and therefore energy. But it is not preordained that demand has to rise to unsustainable levels, even if we provide everyone with sufficient energy. Improved energy intensity is our lowest hanging fruit and can deliver similar economic growth using considerably less energy. Setting aggressive targets on efficiency and demand management could dramatically reduce energy consumption while enabling wider access to energy, saving trillions of dollars, conserving natural resources, and improving environmental performance. Improving efficiency in both energy conversion and widespread end use applications is challenging. But I'm pleased that many nations, including our hosts here in Korea, have already taken bold steps. In Saudi Arabia, we're no different. The government has launched major initiatives to significantly improve the efficiency of energy end use in a range of sectors like industry, transportation, and buildings, both commercial and residential. But in addition to end use applications, also in electric power generation, where we are replacing inefficient power plants and increasingly moving them to gas. But even if we assume the world lowers its future energy intensity to an optimal level, future demand will be much higher than it is today. Which begs the question, how are we going to move, meet that demand? To begin with, the Earth is blessed with a colossal endowment of fossil energy. Take the oil industry. We have already produced about 1.3 trillion barrels, yet proven reserves have never come down. Instead, current proven reserves of 1.6 trillion barrels, which equate to a half century of global oil consumption at current rates, are at their highest level ever. And these numbers will continue to rise with increased exploration and improved recovery rates. At Saudi Aramco, for example, we're on track to increase the average of our conventional oil recoveries to 70%, which is double the global average. So resources are, in fact, abundant. I say this because looking at the Earth's total endowment of liquid fuels, we are blessed with about 14 trillion barrels of original resources in place. This is divided about equally between conventional and unconventional resources, by which we mean tight oil, extra heavy liquids, butamine, and oil shale. When the ingenuity of our scientists and engineers is applied to this massive endowment, current proven reserves have a lot of room to grow. Such reserves will be necessary to sustain rising long-term oil demand. In fact, demand for oil in absolute term, that is in addition to replacing decline and depletion, is likely to rise by about 20 million barrels per day during the next two decades. Ladies and gentlemen, that is equal to the combined production of the two largest producing nations, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Likewise, the world's current gas reserves of more than 7,000 trillion cubic feet have enormous room to grow, considering that the unconventional gas revolution has expanded the world's technically recoverable gas resources 
to the range of 30,000 TCF. If we could economically recover them, they could meet global gas demand at current rates for 250 years. And I'm hopeful that these resources will grow even further because I believe the U.S. shale revolution will spread far and wide as many other areas of the world appear to hold enormous unconventional potential. The rush, ladies and gentlemen, is definitely on. In fact, I am delighted to announce here today that only two years after launching our own unconventional gas program in the frontier region, northern region of Saudi Arabia, we are ready to commit gas for the development of a 1,000 megawatt power plant which will feed a massive phosphate mining and manufacturing center and drive that region's development and prosperity. But ladies and gentlemen, this is just the latest example of oil and gas powering prosperity. They are, that is oil and gas, the most efficient, convenient, economic, and reliable energy sources the world has ever known. And they will undoubtedly continue to be the crown jewels of world energy supplies well into the future. Yet despite their abundance, and because they are the crown jewels, we should use them prudently, efficiently, and more cleanly to secure our energy future. And we do that by leveraging them in combination with other sources like nuclear, hydro, coal, and renewables, which will play an increasingly important complementary role. Let me explain in turn. Starting with nuclear, its prospects have unfortunately been clouded by Fukushima. However, the in inevitable massive growth in demand for electricity means that nuclear will still form a significant part of the electri electricity generation mix in the coming decades. Naturally, of course, legitimate concerns about nuclear safety and the issue of spent fuel disposal need to be addressed. And I believe they will be if we bring our collective ingenuity to bear. Turning to coal and considering its abundance and lower cost, I believe it will always have a role in meeting energy demand as long as we invest in far-reaching technologies that will improve efficiency and environmental performance. However, coal will face stiff competition from ever more abundant supplies of natural gas, especially when considering that coal's carbon emissions and power generation are at least twice that of gas. On top of these core energy sources, renewables will also have a role. Although technical and economic hurdles remain in the way of their rapid deployment. Furthermore, the existing global energy system is massive and will need time to transform even as alternatives and renewables come on stream. But progress is being made. Costs are coming down and the long-term role of renewables is indisputable. Let me also dispel any notion that the petroleum industry views these sources as competitors or displacers of demand. In Saudi Arabia, for example, our vision is to turn the kingdom into a global solar hub. And we are investing heavily in the research, development, and deployment of solar energy. However, that doesn't mean the world can afford to provide costly subsidies on an ongoing basis at the expense of economic development and fiscal imperatives. Rather, the appropriate energy mix should be left to the market and technology to determine. Using the WEC's terms, perhaps we should say that we should allow the jazz scenario to take place. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope everyone leave this Congress with a united view to the world outside, which is that all energy sources will be required in the long term. 
Yet meeting our 2050 energy goals will be easier said than done. Let me outline what I believe are the four key prerequisites for success. First, we need progressive yet pragmatic and plausible global energy policies. Since all energy sources will be required, we shouldn't prematurely pick winners and losers, selectively subsidize, set unworkable targets, or apply unrealistic regulatory and fiscal regimes. Instead, we should invest in technologies and let them mature to offer confidence in large-scale deployment. And let me stress again, allow the markets to work. Also, while the industry need to further enhance the safety and environmental performance of energy sources of all types, there are countless examples of well-intentioned but poorly thought-out policies having multiple unintended consequences. Consider, for example, the undue emphasis on transportation when debating climate change, when in fact, the 50 dirtiest electric power plants in the United States, all coal-fired, by the way, emit roughly as much CO2 as half of America's entire fleet of passenger vehicles. Consider also that mandates on biofuels have caused numerous ripple effects, like higher food prices, that cannot be justified given their questionable environmental benefits on a life cycle basis. So policies need to be more rigorous and holistic, and I believe World Energy Council can play a significant advocacy role here. The second prerequisite is that adequate, timely, and long-term investments, financial investments, must be made in all energy sources to ensure sufficient supplies are safely and reliably produced and delivered to new consumers. In just the next two decades, total energy investment is estimated to be in the range of $40 trillion. That is equivalent to the combined GDP of China, the EU, and the United States. These investments are, are, are staggering, and to fund them continuously, projects will need to be profitable and bankable. For that to happen, we need more certainty in the future direction of world energy markets. We need relatively healthy prices and the pragmatic policies I referred to earlier. Market stability is also critical. And here, Saudi Aramco continues to play a pivotal role. In the past two years alone, we have swung our production by more than one and a half million barrels per day in order to address market supply imbalances. And we continue to make massive investments to maintain the world's largest spare oil production capacity of more than two million barrels per day. But that's only one aspect of our broader investment across the value chain. As part of our drive to become the world's most integrated energy company, we have increased our annual capital budget tenfold from $4 billion to $40 billion in the last 10 years. In addition, we have scaled up our investment in talent, R&D, and technology. In fact, my third prerequisite is game-changing, pace-setting, R&D and technology, because as I indicated earlier, we need to recover more fossil fuels at lower costs and make them greener, make nuclear power plants safer and better dispose of their spent fuel, and enhance the economic viability and competitiveness of alternatives and renewables to unleash their full potential. We've embraced technology at Saudi Aramco, where our strategic goal is to become one of the world's leading creators of energy technologies by 2020. We're multiplying our funding for in-house R&D while forming world-class strategic alliances as part of our open network innovation model. 
and to mitigate the environmental impact of fossil fuels, we're pursuing a broad-based, long-term carbon management program targeting both fixed and mobile sources of carbon emissions. In fact, we are working with the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology to investigate carbon capture as well as its conversion into useful products. That will make hydrocarbon energy more sustainable for producers and consumers alike. And it's just the sort of collaborative win-win we need to see more of. Which leads me to my last prerequisite, collaboration. Let's not jeopardize our chance to make history by working at cross purposes. We must avoid this at all costs because we need, ladies and gentlemen, all energy sources, all industry players, all governments, all academic and research institutions, and all energy bodies working together in the global energy village. And speaking of the global village, if we agree that ready access to clean energy is a right for all, not a privilege for a few, then I believe this Congress should champion this goal and ensure that it becomes an integral part of the UN's future development agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, providing adequate, affordable, and acceptable energy to nine billion people will be the challenge of our lives and of those who follow in our footsteps. But it also represents us with the most inspirational opportunity. So let us relish the fact that we are all in Daegu under this big one roof. And I have no doubt that if we, like our host country, harness all the resources at our disposal, not the least of which the remarkable ingenuity in this room and across our industry, then we too in the energy industry can astonish the world by achieving a sustainable energy future and nine billion people will have the energy they need and so well deserve. Thank you and Kamsa Hamida. Fale, I think you have given us a tremendously rich speech. You have insisted, you have actually insisted on one of the myths that we are also busting here uh, at the Congress. There is no longer peak oil. We have heard you say, um, we have heard, heard you say you would prefer some more jazz in, um, uh, in, on the supply side, which is obviously one of our scenarios. And um, you have also made reference to the massive invest investment amount, the 40 billion the, the, over the next two decades, the half of a world GDP that is required. And obviously that uh, indicates the challenge and you have laid out a, a vision how to go about that. It's now my great pleasure um, to hand over to the second keynote speaker. Please welcome Steve Boltz. He is the um, president and CEO of GE Power and Water General Electric. Good morning. Thank you, Christoph, and thanks, Haleda Afala, for his insightful remarks and your partnership. Also, I want to thank the World Energy Congress and our hosts here at Tegu for gathering us here today and for their warm welcome. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to you. I am keenly aware of the impact energy has on the daily lives of every person on the planet. I see it regularly as I travel around the world. In Indonesia, where a budding economy urgently needs power for industries taking root. In New York City, where reliable energy is assumed until Hurricane Sandy knocked out power and disrupted fuel supplies, bringing the city to a halt. In Dar es Salaam, where new power enabled a school to be established, providing education that gives children skills for the future. And in my own household, 
where my wife and I often wonder whether our three boys would survive without checking their phones 24 hours a day and stealing our power cords. Energy builds modern economies and improves the quality of life. And I am also keenly aware of the 1.3 billion people in the world that still don't have access to power. The fundamental energy challenge we face, and arguably the challenge of our generation, is bringing affordable, accessible, sustainable power to every person. The founder of GE, Thomas Edison, once said, I never perfected an invention that I did not think about in terms of the service it might provide others. I find out what the world needs, then I proceed to invent it. With that in mind, I want to offer four technology developments that I believe will significantly impact tomorrow's energy today, serving the needs of the world. Those areas are, one, the rise of brilliant machines, two, the proliferation of gas networks, three, the decentralization of power, and four, the coming age of age of mainstream renewables. Let's discuss these four themes. First, the rise of brilliant machines. Everywhere I go, whether it's drill sites, power plants, water treatment facilities, grid operators, or industrials, I always get the same questions. How do I get more productivity out of my existing assets? And how do I eliminate unplanned downtime? Brilliant machines are opening new opportunities to achieve those goals. They are enabled by the industrial internet, a major convergence of digital, industrial, and analytical worlds that is taking place right now. It will transform the energy landscape. Brilliant machines are industrial assets that utilize low-cost sensors, vast computing power, data analytics, and ubiquitous communications. These machines are constantly gathering data, connecting fleets, interacting with people. People are using predictive modeling and domain expertise to unleash whole new levels of productivity and to deliver better outcomes. We've all heard of big data. Industrial data is growing 2x any other types of data, including retail. And the machines creating this data will be connected. Over the next 10 years, there'll be 50 billion devices connected to the cloud. Some people say seven years. We have a tremendous opportunity to optimize existing assets, fleets, and networks, both existing and new. Let me give you a couple examples. Today's combined cycle plants have hundreds of sensors collecting over six terabytes of data a year. We can analyze that data for patterns of predictive maintenance and prevent failures. We can also use the data to optimize performance, pushing the machines beyond the bounds in which we know today, because we know more about their actual operating conditions. We've already seen that in plants where you get five to seven percent gains in performance, including one plant here within Korea. We can also find insights about how assets compare across a fleet. We can make average plants on average days the best plant on best days. At the network level, we can have wind turbines and farms that talk to each other, then can predict output and self-optimize based on wind conditions. We are doing some of that today and seeing 5% improvement in performance on existing wind farms. Given the scale of the energy industry, even small improvements in productivity have a big impact. For example, 1% improvement in the fuel efficiency of the world's gas turbine combined cycle systems would yield $8 billion in annual savings at today's gas prices, which could be reinvested. 1% downtime in the oil and gas industry is worth over $50 billion a year. And like the internet revolution, brilliant machines will unleash opportunities we are not even thinking about today. My second point is just as impactful as networks of brilliant machines 
and that is new gas networks that deliver natural gas from where it is abundant to where it is needed. With the help of technology on both supply and demand side, I believe natural gas will surpass oil and coal as the primary fuel for energy consumption somewhere in the 2030 time frame. When I say gas networks, I'm thinking of both physical and virtual pipelines. Technology is making advances in extraction, compression, storage, and transportation that's enabling the growth of these networks. Over the next five years, much of the investment in gas infrastructure will be devoted to the next generation of pipelines, storage, and LNG systems. The bulk of this will be mega pipelines and LNG projects that will anchor gas networks connecting buyers and sellers. But complementing these large scale systems will be a new generation of smaller, modular satellite systems of LNG and CNG. These virtual pipelines will often get the gas the last mile to end users, opening up new applications and demand. We are already seeing virtual pipelines have an impact. Today in Nigeria, at Nestle's Flowergate factory, they need reliable power to produce food products in West Africa. Like many industrials, they opted for on-site power generation, distributed power. The cost of diesel would be a burden on the plant's viability. So a local company sources gas from Shell, Nigeria. They compress it, they truck it in a virtual pipeline, and power reciprocating engines that provide electricity for the site. It represents a 30% decrease in fuel costs and is much cleaner fuel option. And growth in natural gas networks will also enable the next area in which technology will spur game-changing advances, which takes me to my third point, distributed power. The world is increasingly decentralized. Moving away from centralized systems to decentralized networks, we all see this playing out in telecommunications, computing, manufacturing, and it's happening today in the energy world. Our projections show distributed power growing two times faster than centralized systems. Technology advancements, emerging market growth, and access to gas are driving this need. When we speak about distributed power, I'm generally talking about less than 100 megawatts of mechanical or electrical power at or near the point of use. Typical applications are emergency power, self-generation at industrial or commercial sites, and standby backup power. Distributed power is also being propelled by the growth in natural gas accessibility via those networks I spoke about earlier. Those networks are fueling a generation of cleaner, highly efficient, lower costs and dual fuel engines. And more natural gas versus other fuels is a cleaner solution. Distributed power requires less infrastructure. In developing economies where the demand of new power is greatest, there also have largest barriers to central generation. Emerging markets need fast scalable solutions. We see distributed power growing three times faster in the non-OECD countries. People need power now and distributed power can be that answer. And we continue to drive innovation. One of my favorite technology projects is a novel hybrid power solution that combines a fuel cell and a reciprocating engine. Advanced manufacturing has brought down the cost of fuel cells more than 50%. By combining the fuel cell with reciprocating engines, we get scalable one to 10 megawatt solution of power with efficiencies as high as 70%, higher than any existing combined cycle gas plant in the world. Now, don't let me leave you with any wrong impressions. Centralized power is still the most affordable electricity in the world and will continue to be the main source for the foreseeable future. Natural gas-fired power generation, as you know, is growing rapidly. In the US, 
we are undergoing the largest single fuel change in our history, from coal to gas. And the byproduct of this has been a 13% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. since 2008. Gas-fired power plants are more efficient and cleaner than other fossil fuel plants and flexible enough to firm up the growth in renewables on the grid. It is the technology of choice for rapidly growing economies like Algeria and spots of Asia. Coal and nuclear will remain a significant part of the mix. 30% of the new power additions over the next decade will still be coal-fired. Nuclear will have a role because it produces zero carbon power. And we have a large fleet of nuclear power plants out there, and they are safely and reliability providing, reliably providing power today and will so for the coming decades. And then there is the fuel choice that is free. Renewables, that's the fourth technology area I'd like to discuss. When GE got into the wind business 10 years ago, wind was producing electricity at 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Today, we see regions producing wind power at five cents. Technology and scale have reduced the cost of wind power by vastly improving efficiency and reliability, making competitive with mainstream technologies. I believe the world will double its amount of renewable power in wind and solar from five to 10% over the next 10 years. Germany is already at 25%. And we continue to drive towards subsidy-free wind power. We all know the knock against renewables, it's an intermittency. It doesn't produce power when the wind doesn't sh blow or the sun doesn't shine. But the industrial internet and energy storage are now chipping away at this intermittency challenge and making renewables more predictive and dispatchable when needed. Wind turbines today are analyzing mountains of data every second while communicating with neighboring turbines to smooth out power spikes, providing a more predictable stream of energy. And now we're using batteries in wind turbines, along with software to increase efficiency and provide short-term predictability. Even 15 to 30 minutes of predictability has a huge impact on grid interconnection and dispatchability. I'm happy to say renewables are here to stay. Both centralized and decentralized, they will have a significant impact on affordable, sustainable energy for the future. To summarize, brilliant machines, prolific gas networks, distributed power, and mainstream renewables. Four technology trends that will shape the energy future and bring more affordable, accessible, sustainable power to everyone. But like any good business person, I don't want to leave our discussion without noting our action items. I suggest there are two things we can do together to move forward. The first action was touched on earlier is on government policy, which will continue to play a significant role in the implementation of energy technology. We need to accelerate innovation, reduce project costs, and encourage investment. That means supporting free trade. We should avoid policies that slow investment, increase costs, and slow the delivery of energy to people. It also means protecting intellectual property so innovators are encouraged to develop the next big idea and bring, so market, bring to the market. Our second action is we must support education and training. We need to nurture the next generation of energy technologists so we have a strong pipeline of talent who are eager to fulfill the many jobs created by the energy infrastructure. For example, at GE, we are very proud of the work we're doing with Saudi Ramco and my colleague, Khalid, in developing a technical academy in partnership with the Kingdom's Technology and Training Vocational Training Corporation to grow Saudi talent. I know many of us in the room are doing this, and I would encourage us to accelerate our efforts here. So in closing, our challenge is to bring affordable, accessible, sustainable power to everyone, anywhere in the world. Our investments in people 
policy and technology and the impacts they can have make me optimistic about meeting that challenge. Our service to the energy industry makes a difference in people's lives everywhere. That inspires me. Let's find what the world needs and proceed to invent it. Thanks for listening. Steve Waltz, thank you very much for your very thoughtful vision, technology-wise, but also focus on policy. I think with the four themes, the, the productivity through connectivity, the natural gas to distribute the power, and also the renewables, they have certainly a common theme of innovation. And I think you give us a sense that with innovation, we can solve uh, a, a lot of the um, standing issues that, that we need to address. I'd like to benefit, take advantage of the fact that you have been really um, very conscious with the time that we have assigned that gives us the chance to ask a few questions. And obviously today is our scenarios day. In the preparation of this Congress, we have seen that one of the key themes that came out is really the dominance of uncertainty in what many of you are dealing with. The, my first question would really be, how has uncertainty affected things that ha you, your operations? You lead the biggest operations on the technology side, on the oil production side. What do you do differently in that context of huge uncertainty? Khaled. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Christoph. Uh, for us, uncertainty has been part of the landscape uh, in our business uh, since our beginning. So it's really not something uh, new. We've dealt with it uh, over time uh, with, at different levels. At the macro global level, we've realized that the global energy markets are going to fluctuate and swing with economic cycles, with geopolitical issues, and it's well recognized uh, that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, at the highest level has taken on uh, the policy of building extra capacity, of providing a cushion to take those swings in global uh, oil supply and demand balances. This is a very costly uh, position that we have taken. It's costing us billions and billions of dollars to put that capacity in place and to maintain it with the objective of maintaining to the maximum extent market stability and assuring consumers around the world of energy uh, security. If you come down uh, one level below, we've, we look in the future and we realize the potential breakthroughs in technology, development, and economy may go different ways. And one thing we've decided to do is diversify and build a more integrated company, build uh, a strong uh, downstream that will be leading at a global level that will provide additional value to us, additional value to the kingdom, and build uh, on the value of the molecules that we extract from the ground and we market uh, very uh, efficiently. Dealing with uncertainty in general in operations, uh, we, we, our industry is one of the riskiest industry by the nature of the huge industrial uh, nature of dealing with uh, hydrocarbon. So we build safety and redundancy uh, into our uh, design, planning, and strategies to deal with also uncertainty that may result from uh, operations and industrial uh, incidents that unfortunately uh, may happen. I think also at a different level in terms of our capabilities, we realize that events may change by technologies. Some of them were touched on by uh, Steve. And we have elected to be creators of the future rather than reacting to the future. So as I mentioned in my remarks, we're investing heavily, multiplying our investments in capability building, whether it be technologies, human talent, collaboration, and relationship to be part of uh, creating a better future and being able to take advantage of it 
rather than being caught by surprise by it uh, as a recipient of events that happen outside. Thank you, Khaled. It's obviously great if one can create the future, and only few very big uh, can do that. Steve Falls, what, how do you deal um, with um, uncertainty? Uncertainty. Uh, just building off of what Khaled said, uh, our industry cycles. You know, it goes through sometimes periods of five or ten year cycles. Uh, we've seen it before. Uh, some of us remember the uh, U.S. power cycle from the, the late 90s, and, uh, and it cycles down. What have we learned? in cycles is invest for the long term. Uh, during the last down cycle, that's when we put the investments into wind technology. Uh, during some of the more recent cycles, uh, you know, that's when you have to expand out into other technologies. Um, the other thing is always look at where is it in the world? A lot of people look at some of the developed markets, but at the same time, some of the developing markets are in different cycle systems. And as you look at a global business, and that's why, Halid, I think you mentioned the scenarios you run, your business will shift. But if you can be a global player and be the right technology and the right cost competitiveness, that allows you to invest for the long term. Now, we have clearly seen lots of change over the past years. Now, where were you wrongest 10, 5, 10 years ago? Is there anything, what, what, what was your biggest surprise? Where were, were you the most wrong in your way to look forward five, ten years ago, Khaled? Well, uh, if you look at the last, if you look at the last decade, there was this big debate about peak oil, and you refer to it, uh, it's, you know, that, that discussion is, uh, is, is not there anymore. We actually believed all along that resources are plentiful, uh, and it's been, if you go back to the speeches uh, that were made by myself, by His Excellency the Minister of Petroleum, we have consistently said that there is abundance of resources and there is no shortage in supply, but there are shortages in investment across the value chain. In many places, the investment shortages are actually in consuming countries that were over paranoid about uh, shortages uh, and, and, and production. Uh, of oil from producing countries. I was hoping that by now there will be more realization that there is uh, security of supply, that there is multiple sources of all kinds of energy, certainly of petroleum, and that the concern and the hype about energy security will be reduced. Unfortunately, uh, we still uh, hear a lot uh, about it. And, and I would have hoped to see more investment in the infrastructure of uh, consuming countries. I mean, it's ironic, and I think there were references to it in the speeches last night and today, uh, Steve and others, that many of the energy dislocations and interruptions happened because of problems in the consuming countries. Many of them. Uh, you look at Fukushima in Japan. You look at the power shortages here in Korea. You look at the problems that happened in the U.S with, uh, with, with uh, Sandy and, and the other uh, storms and hurricanes and uh, blackouts because of weaknesses in the design of the grid connecting the production of electricity and the consumption of electricity. So I think there needs to be a more balanced view of the total energy value chain and making sure that we have a robust energy system, not only focusing on the production, but also on the delivery, transmission, to the final uh, consumer. Steve, have you been wrong in anything five, ten years ago that you would say to see totally different today? I, th I think if you ask my wife, I've definitely been wrong on a lot of different things. But uh, what I would say is a couple things. Um, one of which is, I wouldn't say completely wrong, but look at the impact shale gas has had and just kind of the, I'm not sure we would have any, any of us would have forecasted that ten years ago. Um, but that continues to roll out. I think the one area that we are, um, have, did not forecast is after the financial crisis that went through the world. Uh, the U.S. for the first time in 2009 had negative load growth for the first time since World War II. We thought after that there would be a slow recovery. In the U.S. today, there's still less load on the market than in 2008. We didn't expect that. We thought Europe, in many spots of Europe, would recover faster. There's still many spots of Europe that aren't at the levels they were back at in 08, 09. So I would just say is how the 
the load has responded over the last five years is less so. And therefore, as you see some of these other technologies come in, it's coming on top of situations creating more excess capacity. So I think that's something uh, that we've had to adjust for. We have very short time for a brief reaction on how has shale gas changed your business, Khalid? Well, I, I, at multiple levels, first of all, I think globally, it reduced the anxiety I referred to earlier about energy security. It's proven what we have been saying for over 10 years, that there are plenty of resources, and with higher prices and better practices of production, those resources will be delivered. And I think the U.S. is only the beginning. We are, uh, as I mentioned, ready to uh, start producing our own shale gas or uh, un unconventional resources of various types in the next few years and deliver them to, uh, to consumers. Uh, in the U.S., of course, tight, sweet oil trapped in various locations changed the refining business. We are invested in Motiva and a number of refineries at the Gulf Coast and their profitability and competitiveness was impacted by uh, the presence of trapped lower cost crude oil within, uh, within the United States. Has um, Steve uh, yeah. shale gas changed your portfolio? Definitely. If you look at the GE portfolio versus 10 years ago, our GE oil and gas business is now the fourth biggest business in the portfolio. It was much smaller than that and part of the energy business 10 years ago. Uh, we've put close to $10 billion of capital to work in the industry, and it's really some of our most, most exciting investments. I think when you look at the world, look at also some of the biggest projects in the world, obviously, in the whole oil and gas space. So uh, it's definitely changing our portfolio. Well, I think with that, I'd um, like to thank um, Steve Boltz, Khaled Al-Fali for great keynotes, and I, I would like to invite you to join me in thanking the keynote speakers for their early up and their great, thoughtful introduction. Thank you very much. We are going to have a short 10-minute break, and we'll be back around 10.03. And Mr. Fry will continue to be our moderator for the morning session. <laughs>